Welcome to the latest episode of Steelcast. So this podcast we've been doing for, for just nearly two years now about sustainability and decarbonising the steel industry. Our first episode was back in February 2022. We interviewed Director of Sustainability Pete Quinn. Uh, the title of the podcast was Don't Mention the C Word, the C being carbon, of course. And although we've been doing these podcasts for two years, the topic of sustainability, uh, energy efficiency, decarbonising the steel industry has been around for some years. But during those two years, we've spoken to experts within Tata Steel, we've spoken to experts outside of Tata Steel, we've spoken to politicians, we've spoken to academics, we've been to exhibitions and conferences, we've even been to the uh, protest rally at Westminster to talk to some of the politicians about the issues that uh, we're facing today. So two years in, we've now got over the hump, which was uh, t- to get some commitment from the UK government to support our decarbonisation programme. And here we sit in February 2024, and Tata Steel in the UK has recently made an announcement about restructuring its UK business, and that restructuring will enable it to transition to electric arc furnished steelmaking. So what better time to talk to the man at the top of the organisation about that announcement and about the green future and the future of the UK steel business for Tata Steel. So really delighted to have some time today and be joined by TB Narendra, CEO and Managing Director, Tata Steel Group. TB, thanks ever so much for joining us. Very, very grateful, but what a perfect time for you to join us on the podcast. It's a seminal moment for the UK business. As I mentioned in the introduction, we made an announcement a couple of weeks ago now. For those people who haven't been following it closely in the news, just talk us through what that announcement was. Sure. Thanks, Tim. And... uh, uh, thank you for inviting me on this uh, podcast. Uh, it's been a pretty uh, uh, tumultuous uh, few weeks for all of us in Tata Steel and more specifically in the UK. Uh, I think for good reason. Uh, this is a business uh, where both the employees and as a parent we've invested a lot over the last 15 years. I know it's a 100 year old business, but uh, we've tried very hard over the last 15 years to keep our business in the UK going. We've invested a lot of money. Our employees have invested in a lot of effort. We've done a lot of restructuring before. Uh, But uh, despite all that we've done, we are still struggling, right? Uh, That's the reality of the industry we are in. It's a global industry. Mm. Uh, We are not only driven by local issues. We are significantly impacted by global issues. So even if I look at the last four or five years, whether it is Uh, energy costs going up with Russia walking into Ukraine, Uh, China exporting a lot of steel in 2015-16, then exporting less and exporting more again last year, Uh, COVID, you know, we had multiple disruptions and every time we realize how vulnerable we are, right? So something had to change. Mm. Our assets are coming to the end of life. So not doing anything is also not an option. Mm. If you didn't do anything, those assets would anyway come to the end of life. The blast furnace, the coke ovens, all our colleagues who are in Port Albert know that for a reality. Uh, And we can't keep pumping in money into a business which is not giving us any return simply because uh, we also are answerable to other shareholders. You know, Tata Group owns 33% of Tata Steel, but Tata Steel is a listed company. 67% of Tata Steel is owned by other shareholders, Mm. by pension funds. People's pensions are invested in Tata Steel. We have more than 3 million retail investors, Mm. people who invested their savings in Tata Steel. You have institutional investors, financial institutions. So they keep asking us, how much longer will you keep supporting this business? Mm. It's already spent 5 billion pounds over 15 years. There's no return. Mm. And is there a plan for the future? So for multiple reasons, we had reached a stage where we had to take a call. We are also conscious that Europe and UK is shifting or encouraging companies to shift to greener process routes. Mm. Uh, and steel is a very big part of the transition because steel is essential. You can't, no economy can do without steel. But at the same time, steel made through the traditional processes using blast furnaces emit two tons at least of yeah. CO2 per ton of steel produced. And because we are a large industry, we account for 8% of the CO2 emissions in the world. So we are not only are we big on a per ton emission basis, we are also big on an aggregate basis. Mm-hmm. Hence, governments, particularly in Europe, and of course in UK, are incentivizing steel companies to transition. So when we had this uh, proposal of 
shifting to an electric arc furnace based production, it addressed multiple things at the same time. Mm -hmm. One is it addressed the fact that we were creating new assets, investing in a new process route, which would have a footprint of 20% of the carbon that we have today. Yeah. Saving the UK government a lot on CO2 emissions and helping them hit their 2030 goals and goals thereafter. Uh, and more and also improving our cost position. Mm. Because one of the problems we've had is uh, on the cost curve in Europe, we are at the wrong side of the cost curve. So every time steel prices drop, we lose money like we've done. Even in the last three months, we've lost 160 million pounds, right? So investing in an EAF which uses locally available scrap helps us move to the better part of the cost curve, mm. helps us become more competitive in this geography, and hence not only helps us transition into a greener process route, it also helps us transition into a more financially uh, sustainable process route. Mm. So we hope with this transition, we are able to create a future which is more secure, but of course, I don't want to give false assurances. We are a global industry, but we have a better chance for the future if we make this transition. And if we don't make the transition, we are basically going down a slippery slope because yes, it's a coming to the end of life. Mm. So it's not been an easy call. It has impacted, I know our decisions to make this transition also comes with an announcement that about 2,800 jobs are impacted, mm. out of which 2,500 are impacted in the next 18 months. Mm. We are very, very sensitive to that. Uh, uh, we would have liked to avoid that. But uh, if we have to survive at the end of this journey, if you have to make good use of the taxpayers' money, mm. we need to create a business which is sustainable. And uh, last year, this time, we thought the entire UK footprint was at risk mm. because there was no support forthcoming from the government. With the support that we're getting from the government and with the 750 million pounds that Tata Steel is putting in, plus continuing to do the loss funding till the transition happens. Yeah. I think uh, we have the best chance in a long time to create a sustainable future. So that's what the announcement was about. It's been difficult. Yeah. But I think uh, sometimes uh, the right decisions are not necessarily the most popular decisions. The right decisions are oftentimes the tough decisions. Yeah. yeah. And it is an enormously complex picture. Uh, this whole transition and the journey towards green steel making and we'll come on to the some of those issues as we go through the conversation uh, This morning and if we don't get to them, maybe we'll have another opportunity in the future But it is enormously complex and every aspect of it uh, is worthy of debate But lots of people you talked about the losses in Tata Steel UK over many years uh, since since Tata Steel Tata group took over the company and the level of investment that the Tata Group is putting into the UK, not just Tata Steel, but in Jaguar Land Rover, the new Gigafactory. A lot of people will say, what is it about the UK that makes Tata want to continue to invest in it? Yeah. So I think uh, when we invested in Chorus, uh, the logic at that time was slightly different. The steel industry was consolidating and growing. Tata Steel in India at that time, uh, or the erstwhile Tata Steel, uh, was one of the most profitable steel companies in the world, but the 55th largest steel company in the yes. world, right? So we were a very profitable, relatively small steel company. And while we wanted to scale up in India, we knew that in India growing organically means acquiring land, building a steel plant, would we would do it, but it would take us time. Mm. But the steel industry globally was scaling up through inorganic growth, just like Arcelor was created and then Arcelor Mittal was created. Mm. Right, uh, So we wanted to also scale up through inorganic growth and that's why we acquired uh, Nat Steel in Singapore in 2005, uh, what is today Tata Steel Thailand in 2006 and Chorus in 2007. Mm. So with these acquisitions we uh, became from an India focused steel company to a global steel company from the 55th largest we became the 10th largest which yeah. gave us scale. <laughs> it's a different matter that after that the global financial crisis happened. Mm. So while our Dutch business uh, has done quite well in terms of being able to sustain itself, being positive cash, positive EBITDA all the years, apart from maybe last year because of the blast furnace relining, uh, because structurally the Dutch business wasn't a stronger place. It's a coastal plant, it has a pellet plant, all the coke that it needs it makes, mm. you know, uh, 
uh, it's got a better product mix in some sense of the term. Yeah, it's downstream units. Downstream the units. Side. So yeah. it's a better integrated facility in yeah. some sense. In UK, we had facilities all over the place, mm. you know, because of historical reasons. Right. I remember at that time when we looked at it, I think uh, even the logistics cost in UK was much higher because we were moving stuff more than we were doing in Netherlands or in India. Mm. Because some of the plants, downstream plants are far away from mm. where the steel plant is. And even the steel plant itself was over multiple sites. Mm. So when the steel prices dropped, the vulnerabilities of the UK business was very visible. Mm. Uh, but we felt, I mean, the Tata group always thinks long term. So mm. to go back to your question, once you invest in a facility, you want to try and make it work, right? And which is what we tried hard to do. Mm. At around the same time, I think it was maybe a year after that or a year before we acquired Jaguar Land Rover, right? And uh, Tata Chemicals has a footprint here as well. Yeah. I think before that, Tata T, the, then Tata T had acquired Tetley. That's right. right? Yeah. So it just so happened that multiple Tata companies, and then of course Indian hotels had a presence here, the, uh, that time with Holiday Inn, and then I think St. James Court. Uh, TCS always had a presence here. Yeah. Uh, so you had multiple Tata companies, and of course as Tata Group, we've been here as Tata Limited for more than 100 years. Mm -hmm. So there has been a long association uh, with uh, the UK. Multiple Tata companies saw opportunities and invested in companies based out of the UK. So for Tata Group, UK became the most important market uh, from an investment point of view outside of India. Mm. So even today, uh, the maximum investment the group has made outside India is in the UK. Yeah. Right? So there is a association with the UK which has grown stronger. Uh, we've had some challenging uh, situations in Tata Steel UK. Mm. Jaguar Land Rover has done very well. Yeah. Right? So it's been a mixed bag. But that the fact that it's an important geography uh, also encourages us to do the best we can to keep the businesses going. So that's why even today, even though we've lost a lot of money uh, in the UK uh, trying to support the business, we are still putting in more money because yeah. we believe that if we put in more money, we can uh, create a sustainable business. Yeah. And hopefully, uh, we will have a situation where we are not always fragile. You know, where we, can, we are self-sustaining and we can grow the business. And since this is a new beginning for the steel industry globally, a new process route in some sense, not a new process route. Uh, electric car furnaces have been around for a very long time. Mm. Uh, but traditionally, you never optimize based on the CO2 footprint. Now we're optimizing based on the CO2 footprint and that gives us an opportunity to create a very different future. Yeah. So I, I, that's the reason why for the group UK is important. Uh, and the group, like I said, always thinks long term. And I mean, if we were a short term player, we would have exited long back. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I know it took a little while to get over the hump of getting government support for the yeah. decarbonizing the steel industry. But do you see the UK as, as an attractive place for inward investment? Tata Group must be one of the largest private investors in the UK in terms of the legislative framework, the proximity to mainland Europe. Is that another reason why it's attractive to be in the UK? Absolutely. So the, each market has its own or each uh, geography, I would say, has its own uh, value, right? So let's say when we invest in India, we invest for growth. Mm. All the businesses are growing, right? Uh, when we invest in some of these markets outside of India, uh, it is also to deal with a more evolved marketplace, more sophisticated customers, a regulatory environment, uh, which in some sense uh, is a precursor to what we will experience in India in some years from now, uh, you know, things like that. So it allows us access uh, to a lot of experiences, which will also help us in other geographies. Sure. So whether it's, so when you're operating in Southeast Asia or in the US or in UK or in Europe, there are a lot of learnings, just like there are a lot of learnings from India, which you can bring to many of the geographies. Vice versa, a lot of learnings in these geographies mm. which you can bring back to India. Yeah, and I want to come on to that at the end, this sort of global perspective of the yeah. Tata Steel Group. But if we for a moment go back to the, the, the transition to green steel making, we've, we've announced that our ambition is to move to electric arc furnace. And I think most commentators would agree that for steel companies in Europe, that's the way to go. If you want to decarbonize electric arc furnace, you know, whether you bolt on other bits or, or not is, is the sensible way to, to go uh, for lots of reasons. But people will be saying, we understand that we have to replace the blast furnace. We understand they're aging. Uh, 
some older than others, uh, and we understand electric art furnace is the new technology, but people are saying, but why do you have to make the changes so quickly? Why do we have to shut the heavy end in Patal, but now, and then have a sort of an empty period to transition to the electric art furnace? Yeah. What, what has brought that forward? So there are uh, multiple reasons for it. Uh, one is, of course, equality of assets and the life of the assets. Like you said, some of the assets are closer to the end than the others, right? Uh, so even if you close one blast furnace and a coke ovens, and you run the other blast furnace, you need to buy all the coke that you need. Without a coke ovens, you're going to have higher energy costs because you won't have the coke oven gas. Our own calculations, uh, which we are, of course, discussing with the unions, is that operationally, we will have to fund another 600 million more than what we have planned. Because the loss funding is not going to come from anywhere. Yeah. No government is going to give us loss funding. They may give us money to spend on uh, constructing something. Mm. But no government will be able to write a check to fund losses of a private sector company. You will run into subsidy issues. Taxpayers won't be happy if you start writing checks to fund losses. Mm. right? So this is 600 million additional cost to whatever we are budgeting. Because you know when we say it's 1.25 billion, that's just a project cost. Whatever are the losses we incur between now and the electric arc furnace coming yeah. up is to Tata Steel's account. Yeah. Which is already more than 500 million for this year, which is equivalent to what the government is giving us. Yeah. Right. So it's not a small loss. And if we say that in addition to the losses we anticipated, we have to fund another 600 million loss, it's enormous. Yeah. You know, it's very difficult for any listed company to defend it. Uh, we are seeing that if we uh, were to change the uh, way in which we construct the EF, because let's understand the electric arc furnace is being constructed in our existing steel mill shop, yeah. because we're going to upgrade the casters and use existing casters, yeah. right? So if you're going to r run a blast furnace, you're running the existing steel mill shop. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of that, you're going to construct an electric arc furnace. So anyone who's worked in that steel mill shop will know what it means from a complexity point of view. You have very high temperature liquid moving around and then you have a con people trying to construct something. So it's going to be enormously challenging, fraught with risk. Mm. We see that the capital cost is going up by about 200 million, the engineering that we've done, mm. in addition to the 600 million operational losses. We are seeing that the schedule may get impacted by at least 10 months because there's a complexity in mm. scheduling because yeah. the shop is running. Yeah. You can't construct whenever you want. Mm. So there's this. Then obviously the rate at which your CO2 comes down slows down. Mm. So there is a conversation with the government. The government is giving us 500 million because the CO2 is coming down at a certain rate. Mm. right? So that's going to get delayed because you're going to be running one blast on us. So I think the uh, complexities, the financial challenges, the operational challenges, the again you're back to the discussion with the UK government. I think all this will just delay this project. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, and create more complexity for us. The last thing I want is, I don't want at the end of this transition to again have a business which is struggling. Yeah. Because the project costs have gone up, the schedule is all over the place, we spend more money than we thought. Mm. And at the end of the transition, you again have a business which is struggling to survive. Yeah. That will be a waste of all the efforts and all the, yeah. uh, uh, you know, money we are putting in and everything else. So, I think we just need to be a bit conscious of that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and we are happy to discuss this in detail with the union so that they understand this. I mean, they are all operators themselves. Yeah. So, uh, there is a financial part of it, there is operational mm -hmm. challenge uh, part of it as well. And of course, you will have heard that some people are worried that if we can make the model work of importing material from overseas and make that financially viable, that we're never going to build an electric arc furnace. They'll so say, just run the UK business as a, as a rolling coating tube making business. Is that, is that realistic or is that, is that dream world to say that's a, a viable operating model? No, so Tim, a few things. Firstly, uh, you know, our own agreement with the UK government is such that we won't get any money if we don't build an electric arc furnace. Yeah. It's a milestone based funding, right? So the government is not going to give us a check for 500 million and let us do what we want. They will only give it, give us some money if we do what we are promising to do. If I step back, if that was the objective, why go through all this? We should have just consulted saying we are closing the heavy end. Mm. Why waste time negotiating a deal with the government? Yeah. 
we would have just said, hey, this is the way forward. Because we didn't do that because we didn't want to give up on preserving steel making in Port Talbot. Mm. And we said the best way to preserve steel making in Port Talbot is to build an electric furnace. Yeah. So let's discuss with the government how to make that work. Yeah. That was the starting point. If the objective was just to you know, run downstream, we could have done that long back, yeah. even two, three years back, right? Or whenever. So I think uh, I understand that fear, but I think uh, we, are, uh, we are kind of, if that was the objective, we would have done things very differently. We mm -hmm. didn't have to go through this very convoluted process to yeah. uh, close the heavy end and then say that we are not going to build an electric car furnace. We are, in fact, honestly, we are ready to place the orders. Yeah. Uh, we want actually to start the construction as soon as possible. That's why we are working with the unions to find a solution soon. Because I also feel the sooner we build the electric arc furnace, the sooner we can get steel making back, the sooner we can give comfort to our customers, to our downstream units, and to our employees, the better. Yeah. So, we are ready to go yeah. as soon as we are allowed to go. And as you mentioned earlier, that uh, the announcement will impact a huge number of jobs within the company. And you will understand that you know, there'll be some people in the organization who have spent their whole life here and they're ready to retire and they're ready to go. But there's a huge number of people who, who aren't in that position, who will be you know, relatively young, relatively few years of service, very capable, talented people that aren't going to have a job. And in a community that, you know, especially in Patal, but there isn't that much else around uh, for them to go to. And even if there was, they'll be competing with a thousand other people potentially. You know, how, what is it you can say to those people about, it's all very well saying, well, we're going to have a sustainable green future. And they say, well, I don't care. I haven't got a job. Sure. That's hard. Absolutely. I fully understand that. That's why we want to move forward to get into the next level of discussions. Let's understand who are the people, like you said, who uh, are raising their hand for voluntary redundancies, who are willing to go who amongst them, we are okay to let them go. Because there may be some who are willing to go who we may need yes. for the future, right? So there's a conversation to be had there. Who are the people who want to work and we need to find alternate jobs for them, right? So I think we need to get into those individual mm. level discussions as soon as possible to give people some comfort about the future, mm. right? Uh, we are investing significantly or we've already announced that we've at least 130 million pounds is being kept aside for the separation, uh, separation packages and things yeah. like that, right? We will discuss with the unions on that. Mm. In addition, the transition fund where we are contributing 10, uh, 20 million and the government is contributing 80 million. So I, I, I think to assuage some of these anxieties, we really need to get into the detailed discussion. Mm. We need to look at how can we redeploy people wherever people are willing to be redeployed. We must also not underestimate the economic activity that will be created at least for the next three years because of the construction on the yes. site. A lot of people uh, uh, you know, will be required. Mm. A lot of technical people, a lot of craftspeople, a lot of engineers because you need civil engineers, you need uh, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, mm. you need welders, fitters, mm. fabricators, piping guys. Yeah. You need all of them constructing a steel plant or a uh, spending 1.2 billion pounds in, uh, you know, building something is yeah. a lot of money going to local vendors and various other people. Mm -hmm. So I think there will be a lot of economic activity which will be created on site. Uh, there is a need for us to do a lot of detail level planning mm. at an individual level. Uh, we want to be as sensitive as possible, as empathetic as possible, mm. so that uh, as many people uh, we can help we would like to help in making this transition, mm -hmm. right? So there is disruption for sure. Yeah. But can we uh, reduce the pain of the disruption as much as we mm -hmm. can? That's for sure. Because I think lots of people will have this hope or vision for the future, for the Patalbot reason especially, and I know lots of our listeners will be across the UK and we'll talk a bit about the downstream businesses shortly. But in Patalbot especially, people will say, well, you know, how quickly can the Celtic Freeport develop? How quickly can we get inward investment? How quickly can the steel business here be part of a hub such that we're not concentrating on the number of employees employed by one employer? We're talking about the number of skilled people who can earn a good living in a, in a, in a region. But that seems quite a long way away, doesn't it? You know, how can, what is it you can do with uh, local governments, national governments to speed up 
that inward investment and that transition to a, a green industrial hub? So I think the starting point is for us to create a green and sustainable steel business itself, mm. right? Today, when you look at it, the narrative is all about Tata Steel UK making losses, Tata Steel UK struggling to survive. But if by 2027, we can create a green steel plant, which looks good, looks like uh, it's going to be sustainable financially, there'll be a lot of confidence. So mm. anyone who wants to use that steel, mm. Uh, I'm sure we'll look at setting up uh, facilities close by, right? Yeah. And they know that this is, is a new investment, it's there for the future. And UK has scrap, this is a scrap-based plant, you're not dependent on geopolitical issues. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of discussion now on the sovereignty. 90% of the raw materials we were using in Port Albert came from outside. 90% of that will come from within UK. So I think we, we are, from a sovereignty point of view, in a much better place. Right? Our supply chains are local. Mm. So we are less vulnerable to geopolitical issues. Mm. And what I hear from the UK government and everyone else is hopefully energy costs in the UK will come down in the future because of significant investments in green energy. Mm. That sets us up well. Local scrap, competitive energy prices, we are in a good shape. And I have also said that this need not be the last chapter of our investment. This is the first chapter of a new investment. Mm. If you have a sustainable business, if there are questions around DRI, if there's a lot of gas available in Port Talbot, because it's not just having gas available, you need a lot of gas available. Mm. We are working out how much of gas will be required if you were to set up a million tons of DRI or mm. one and a half million mm. tons or whatever. Mm. What price should it be available at for it to be viable? Is there a business case for an investment? So the electric arc furnace doesn't limit us. Yeah, You can always invest uh, in a DRI unit if the economics yeah. is there. So it can become the beginning of a new journey. I'm not saying it's uh, guaranteed. Mm. I'm not saying it's going to be easy or inevitable. We have to work hard for it. Yeah. But at least the prospects of that are brighter than the prospects of running the existing mm. uh, assets, the existing configuration in a world which is becoming less and less forgiving of industries emitting CO2. Yeah, yeah, and it's an interesting point you do pick on DRI, and we'll come on to maybe a bit more detail about that, because people will look at Tata Steel Group, of which you're the CEO and manager director across the world, and say, how comes you've got different strategies in different locations? Because in the UK, it's EAF and nothing else yet. In Imalden, you're just restarting a blast furnace number six, and so that's got a long, long life left in it. And you're talking about potential for hydrogen-based DRI. And in Kalinagar in India, you're talking about a brand new blast furnace. Sure. It's like, well, this doesn't seem like you've got a consistent strategy across your businesses. How would you respond to that? Sure. No, that's because the strategy has to reflect the local context, right? UK is an exporter of scrap. Yeah. India is an importer of scrap. Mm. Netherlands does not have so much of scrap because it doesn't have manufacturing industry as much as the UK has, right? Uh, Netherlands has gas available in Amudin, right? So, so in India, there's no gas, there's no scrap. <laughs> you have coal. Even that coal is not so great. You have to import coal from Australia. Mm. India is a growing market. So if you didn't build capacity, you would lose market share, yeah. right? Uh, so, so the context is different. So when I look at Netherlands, uh, we are building an EF. But we're building a DRI with the EF mm. because there is gas available in Amodin. Mm. And the Dutch government is saying they will make hydrogen available. And as and when hydrogen is available, we'll look at shifting from gas to hydrogen. Mm. The blast furnace which has been relined is because the first blast furnace we want to close as soon as we come into an agreement with the uh, Netherlands government. Mm. The second blast furnace will close after five, six, seven years. Mm. So that's why the blast furnace was relined. So that we need to run it till 2030 or 2035 depending on uh, what is the uh, time scale in which uh, we can make the transformation? Because mm -hmm. here it is transforming 3 million tons, there it's transforming 7 million tons. Yeah. Right? So it's a much bigger transformation. And so we will do it in through two stages, like we're doing here, first stage of 3 million, mm -hmm. then we need to do a second stage of the balance 4 million. Uh, so that's the strategy there. In India, the market is growing at uh, 10 million tons a year. Mm -hmm. So as Stardust Steel, we need to add a couple of million tons a year just to stand on the spot. Mm -hmm. Right? And there is no gas in India. India mm. is an importer of gas. Mm. Mm. There's no gas pipeline in eastern India to help us even if we uh, want to sh shift to gas-based DRI. There is no scrap in India. India exports about 8 million tons or 10 million tons of scrap every year. 
you can, right? yeah. 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 So yeah. so we don't have a choice. Yeah. We have to invest in steel yeah. making capacity, which is a natural progression for most economies. Mm. Why did we build a blast furnace here 100 years back? Because there was no scrap. Mm. Because there was iron ore and coal. <laughs> Yeah. Right over a period of time, the iron ore and coal business to closed in the UK, and yeah. now there is scrap available. Yeah. So why would we not use scrap which is available mm. today? Because we've consumed steel for hundred years. Yeah. And hence there's scrap available. But you will yeah. understand people in the UK saying, "You're extending the life of the blast furnace in the Netherlands for another seven years. Blast furnace four arguably could stretch through to 2030, 2032. Why can you not have the same?" Uh, policy or direction in the UK and keep that blast furnace running. Does it, does it literally come down to the, uh, the age of the assets that surround the blast furnace in the UK? Does it come down to cost? Both. Yeah. Yeah. So the financial bleed is unaffordable. Mm. I mean, the Netherlands uh, does not require any support from Tata Steel in India. Uh, they generate their own cash flows. Yeah. Right. Uh, so they are not in the situation that the UK is where to keep the blast furnace running, if you have to spend a few hundred million Every year, the question is, for what, yeah. you know, uh, uh, what's the game plan, you yeah. know? So it's the unfortunate reality of the situation. Uh, when we relined the blast furnace here a few years back, that was also to keep it going uh, yeah. as long as we could. That's right. Same thing in the Netherlands. We're yeah. doing that only, uh, uh, you know, to keep it going as long as it should. Because the last thing you want is no blast furnace and no plans for an electric arc furnace. Yeah. Right? Uh, that would have hastened the end. Yeah. And I know you've not ruled out building a DRI plant in the UK, but they're generally bigger than what we'd need, possibly. And there's a question about gas. On the, I mean, there's lots of gas coming in from Milford Haven. But as I understand, you know, the ambition for an arc furnace in the UK would be to maximise the amount of scrap and minimise the amount of iron that you have to put into it. And if you go down that road, does it get to a place where you go, DRI probably doesn't make sense because we've ma maximised our scrap? And anyway, it wouldn't employ that many people, would it? Yeah. Uh, to answer your second question, yeah, uh, it wouldn't. Maybe two, three hundred. A DRI unit uh, would not need too many people. But to answer your first question, or the first part of your question, see, the amount of DRI you put into the electric arc furnace will depend on the products that you want to make. Mm. DRI will always be more expensive than scrap in some sense of the term. Yeah. Right? So it's, you wouldn't just want to fill your furnace uh, with more DRI than you need. Mm. Right? So the way we look at it, some DRI, some iron content you will need in the electric arc furnace because of the product mix we want to make. So the requirement of DRI uh, may not be more than a million tons. So any facility, and that's a minimum size of a gas-based DRI. Mm. So while in Netherlands you may look for building a 2.5 million ton unit uh, because you're producing 7 million tons, here you may not need more than a million tons. Mm. So you will plan uh, accordingly once the gas is available and there's a business case uh, for this DRI. But yes, you will look at the value in use mm. and mac uh, maximize a mix uh, or optimize a mix based on the value in yeah. use between scrap and DRI. But part of it's got to be a law of diminishing returns. You know, we've talked about if you invest in an electric arc furnace here, you reduce the carbon footprint by five million tons a year, which is enormous, really unfathomable. Whereas a DRI plant, is much, it's a big still financial big investment, but it reduces that carbon footprint by maybe a tenth of that. So is it, is it a case of saying, look, if you've got a piece of money, spend it where you get your most bangs for your buck and then worry about the other bits afterwards? Yeah. No, so the, what you're saying is right. Uh, a DRI unit is better than a blast furnace, mm. but not better than an electric car furnace from a CO2 footprint. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's why that for that reason also you would only add the minimum amount of DRI that is required because every time you add DRI it's directly reduced iron mm. so you're reducing it using gas mm. or uh, coal mm. as compared to scrap which you're melting and if the energy is green mm. you're not uh, you know adding any CO2 yeah. uh, eventually uh, if there's hydrogen available and in plenty then you can have green DRI mm. And it's okay. more tempting. Yeah, but honestly, that's some distance away because yeah. while everyone talks of hydrogen, you need a lot of hydrogen. You need to be uh, it available at one and a half uh, dollars a kilo. Yeah. Uh, so I don't see a lot of green hydrogen being available at that price for these applications yeah. in a hurry. And lots of people are, you know, rightly so ambitious about what the future could be in the UK steel industry and saying, well, why don't you have a DRI plant? Why don't you have a thin slab caster? Why don't you invest in other pieces? People start talking about a plate mill in the UK to supply the wind turbine market, for example. 
Are these on your radar or are you saying, look, one step at a time, let's walk before we yeah. can run? I think what is important as we make this new journey is to make sure we build a sustainable business. We need to make sure that we deploy capital very carefully. Don't burden ourselves with a lot of investments which we can't uh, support in terms of, because ultimately that's a capital that we will carry here in the business. You don't want to burden the business with more capital than yeah. it uh, required. Uh, so I think we have to be very careful about uh, deciding what we want to spend money on. We've decided so far on this project. Yeah. Let's make it work. Mm -hmm. We are open to all options. And if there is a big market for all these deals, for all these requirements, and there's a business case for it, why not? Yeah. Surely, because ultimately anything which can help us unlock the value in this business will mean that all the efforts all of us have put in as employees, as shareholders, etc. for the last 15 years is worth it. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, if we can at the end of the transition create a sustainable business in the UK, I think that will be a great legacy for all of us to leave behind. And so are you saying that the UK going forward will have to earn future investments? I think uh, we have supported it extensively. Uh, I hope we are this investment is creating a future which is self-sustainable. Yeah. That's the ideal thing because then you're not, you're in control of your own destiny in some sense. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I think that's where we should aim to be. All businesses should be able to stand on its own. And as I said at the beginning, all of these things are so complex and I could literally talk to you all day about, uh, about this. But, you know, we say electric arc furnace, it's not just a case of buying one on the shelf, bolting it in and everything's happy. And people have rightly got questions about saying, well, you know, are we going to be able to supply all the grades we currently supply uh, through our downstream businesses and commercially, you know, are the energy costs going to be bearable and what is the UK government doing to, to, to support us on that? And what does the scrap supply chain in the UK looks like? You know, it's not just a case of saying there's yeah. a lot of it. It's like, well, is it the right stuff and is it in the right place and does it supply the, the products for our customers? How worried are you about all those issues? No, I think uh, we shouldn't underestimate the uh, complexities and the challenges we have to deal with. Like you said, the steel business is not a simple business, whether you make steel using electric arc furnaces or blast furnaces, right? Uh, so that's why we actually want to move forward fast so that we can start, you know, spending a lot more time on planning the future, you know, and on these things. A lot of work is already going on, on these areas. We've looked at the scrap supply chain, who's doing what, who are the players, uh, who could be the suppliers, do we have opportunities to invest in some of those facilities? Do we need to create some of those facilities? Do we need partnerships? We are looking at all that, right? yeah. uh, so that we can secure the uh, uh, value chain for that. Energy costs have been a very important part of our discussions because we do believe not just for the steel industry, for manufacturing in the UK, energy costs need to come down. Mm. Otherwise, you will always be handicapped, yeah. right? So I think that's a larger problem and mm. I think the government is conscious of it. Mm. Uh, I think both the political parties are conscious of it. Mm. Uh, so I hope that over a period of time, this disadvantage in some sense uh, will get addressed. Uh, we are also looking at technology. Tata Steel, not just in UK, in India also has been largely a blast furnace player, right? Mm. In Netherlands as well. So a lot of R&D and technology work over the last 100 years is focused on blast furnace based steel making. Yeah. We need to now pivot towards el electric arc furnace based steel making. And it's happening globally, right? So yes, some of the very clean grades of steel which are required in packaging and auto skin panels, etc., are not made through the electric arc furnaces yet. Mm. Okay, but 30 years back, uh, 40 years back when Newcor started making flat products through uh, electric arc furnaces, everyone laughed at them. Today, they are the most valuable steel company in the world. Yeah. Right, they are twice the market cap of Tata Steel. Yeah. They produce less steel than Tata Steel. Wow. Yeah. But uh, that's where they are. They are mm. twice the market cap of ArcelorMittal. Mm. They are twice the market cap of Bow Steel, the biggest steel plants wow. in the world. Wow. Because uh, their carbon footprint is less than 0.4. Mm. Almost 100% of their production is electric arc furnace. Mm. They produce flat products and long products. They unlock a lot of value. Mm. So, so we have to ask ourselves, if we are in this business, how can we unlock more value for ourselves, for you know, our employees, yeah. our yeah. shareholders, whoever, yeah. right? Uh, so if a business like Newcor, which didn't exist 100 years back when all of us were created, whether Tata Steel in India or Tata Steel UK or Tata Steel in Netherlands, 
could be created and become the most valuable steel company in a lifetime. Mm. You know, that, that asks questions of ourselves. Yeah, Why can't we be doing that? And that too in a country which is exporting a lot of scrap, like the yeah. US. Yeah. US and UK are the biggest exporters of scrap. Yeah. And 70% of the steel in the US is made using electric arc furnaces. 70, why should yeah. 70%? Yeah. So why should we be so hesitant about leveraging the scrap that is available here yeah. to make steel and uh, create a profitable, sustainable business? And I'm sure we could do an entire podcast on the topic of scrap and uh, uh, on and, and all the challenges of it. Because currently, you know, here in Portal, but I think we use something like 600,000 tonnes of scrap every year. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, by the end of this year, we'll be using none because the heavy end will close. Mm. And then we'll be using none for two or three years. And then all of a sudden, we're going to want two million tonnes. Yeah. That's going to be a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. So we have to plan for that. We have to plan the supply chain. The work has started. We are not able to take conclusive steps because we need to get through with a consultation and things like that. Uh, so, uh, so that's why I think uh, the next few weeks and uh, months are very critical as we finalize our plans in consultation with the unions. And I hope we can reach a stage where we can move forward fast. Yeah, super. Now, when we talk about tar steel in the UK, of course, the focus has been about Patal, but, but the downstream businesses are actually where the money is made. It's where the sharp end for the customers is. Those businesses are going to need to be supported during this transition. And understandably, they'll be quite concerned about how confident you are that they'll be able to be supported with the imports of substrate, but also about whether there's any money left to invest in those downstream businesses such that they can come out of this transition on top form as well. What what? confidence can you give those businesses? Sure. No, I think the reason why we want to import slabs and coils is so that we can keep the downstream businesses coming and our customer service, right? The last thing you want is to make them feel uh, uh, uncertain about their future, right? So that's why we want to import, uh, 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 you know, slabs and coils. That work has already started. Mm -hmm. uh, I would think 50% of those slabs and coils uh, will come from Tata Steel India and Tata Steel Netherlands. The balance 50 we'll have to source from other suppliers. Mm -hmm. Again, conversations are going on on that. Uh, so I think we, we are in the process of tying up all that. But again, we are waiting for the consultation process to complete so that we can start, announce some of, uh, start announcing some of those details. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, yes, uh, if there's a business case for downstream investments, happy to do that. I, I, I don't think we've ruled that out. And always, typically, downstream investments are of a smaller scale than mm -hmm. what is required in the upstream so, uh, if uh, some of them need some investments, uh, which can be, uh, if there's a business case for it, why not? We can look at it. Now, we've talked today about lots of these issues, about scrap, about energy, um, uh, about the legislative framework, about carbon taxes and so forth. What is it that you would ask of the UK government, either the current one or the next one that's coming in, that would help us through this transition and help us to become a sustainable business. And how closely are you working with them on some of those issues? One of the most important issues is energy costs, mm. right? I think uh, that is very important. Uh, we will be even more dependent on energy costs than we are today as we shift to the new process route. So I think that's very important. Uh, the second part is, of course, uh, uh, to look at how can we encourage local steel making, mm. you know, because we are investing in steel making facilities locally. Uh, what is it that can be done to encourage uh, uh, local consumption? You know, whether it's yep. in investments in infrastructure, yep. whether it is uh, in some sense helping locally produce steel in some way or the other. I think all those will certainly help us, uh, you know. Uh, and in the long run, uh, how can you further incentivize green steel? Mm. Uh, you know, uh, because Ultimately, green steel will be successful if uh, customers are willing to pay more, mm. if companies like ourselves are willing to invest in it, which you're doing, and if governments are willing to support like they're doing. Right? Mm. So all three stakeholders need to come together to make it a success. And that is true of, if you look at the solar and wind industry, it yep. wouldn't have survived without uh, these three stakeholders playing their role. Mm. The mobility industry, electric cars would never have come in if you didn't have the incentives that they were yeah, yeah. for consumers to buy electric cars and for uh, uh, you know governments to help uh, industry. So I think transition to green cannot happen by itself. Mm. 
it needs to be supported by policy needs to be supported by infrastructure mm. it needs to be supported by customers willing to pay more and it needs to be supported by industry willing to invest in it yeah and i guess one over the next few years one of the issues we're going to look at is saying well we're going to start importing we're going to be one of the biggest importers of steel in the world probably we'll be looking for two million tons or or more three million tons of imported coal and substrate which are currently subject to tariffs and quotas now that's down to the government to say whether they want to help us or not yeah. so are those discussions ongoing and what level of confidence have you got that that that's not going to be a barrier to to our sustainability so i think that's part of the conversation with the government because this is at best a temporary measure yeah so can we have a window during this transition where we can get some uh, flexibility there uh, for these reasons mm -hmm. i mean if you didn't do it our downstream and our customers would uh, struggle uh, and then we switch back and that's why we want to build the electric arc furnace before the impact of the carbon border adjustment mechanism mm. starts getting felt yeah but that's a great time for us to be producing steel locally which is green yeah now you talked earlier about tartar as a company being in it for the long term as a visionary company and all of those who have experienced being part of the group for the last 15 years will will concur with that and will agree with this and we'll see it absolutely and and when you look at tar steel in the UK, we could talk about the technology and the scrap and the electric art furnaces and this, that and the other. But do you have a vision for the steel industry in the UK for five years or 10 years and the role it will play? And what does that vision look like for you as leader of the organization? I think for me, the great opportunity in UK and in Europe is to be the torchbearer for green steel making, right? Uh, because most of the steel making in the world is outside the UK and Europe. But this geography, because of the fact that the policy has evolved on this for the last many years, the governments are supportive, the customers are supportive, has an opportunity to really lead the way and be the role model for the rest of the world. Mm. That to me is the role that both UK and Europe can play so that other steel companies elsewhere, other governments elsewhere uh, are encouraged mm. to bring in similar policies, bring in similar support and companies uh, are then encouraged to invest mm. in this transition faster than they are. And do you see, do you see for Tata Steel Group, do you see this investment in the UK as almost like a pilot to say, listen, let's see what happens in the UK, let's see the difficulties, let's see how we can make it work, let's see how we can progress the technologies, let's see which markets we can serve and can't serve. And then you can take that experience and knowledge and share it in other parts of Tata Steel Group. Is that, is that Absolutely. the plan? Absolutely. It's already happening. Mm. We've already uh, built a scrap processing facility in India. Mm. We are already investing in an electric arc furnace in India. Mm. It, there's no incentive for us, uh, uh, but we are doing it because we know that this is going to happen. Yeah. Right? Uh, so, and because we are a profitable business in India, we can... Uh, you know, do those experiments, right? So we are already doing that. We have an internal carbon pricing policy in Tata Steel in India. Mm. There is no carbon price uh, in India, right? But we uh, we use the European carbon price as a mirror, and when we take capital uh, allocation decisions in India, we put this price and look at the carbon adjusted IRR. Mm. Uh, we've already announced that Tata Group and Tata Steel will be net zero by 2045, yeah. which very few large steel companies have said. Mm. India as a country has said India will become net zero by 2070. So we are committing to become net zero, even if I leave out Europe, where we'll be net zero yeah. much earlier mm. in India by 2045, 25 yeah. years ahead yeah. of what the country is committed, right? Yeah. So we want to be uh, seen as a leader in this journey, mm. uh, as one of the leaders, if not the leader. And hence our experience in Europe will help us prepare better for that transition in India. Mm -hmm. So while in India we have a challenge of growth as well to deal with, we also want to make those investments and changes that are required so that we are better prepared uh, for the future that we see for ourselves in Europe. Yeah. Now, I'm very conscious I've taken a lot of your time this morning and it's been fascinating. I could literally talk to you all day about it and maybe we'll get you back for another podcast as things progress. But I want to lastly take you from that visionary uh, explanation of where you see the group Back to, uh, right down to the detail of the day today, because here we are sitting on 2nd of February recording this podcast, and there's, you know, the coming days and weeks and months, 
they got quite difficult and people want some clarity about what happens next. What do you see happening in, in the next few days, the next few weeks and the next few months in terms of the people, the assets, the start of the new project? So I think uh, we are focused now uh, in the next few weeks uh, to uh, progress on the consultation, hopefully conclude it as soon as we can, because uh, the sooner we conclude the consultation, the sooner we can give more certainty mm. to the people. I'm conscious that the consultation happens at the national level, at the local level, and also at the individual level. So, uh, so that's our objective, mm -hmm. work with the unions. Can we find a way to move fast to a future which is, yes, painful for some, but uh, also at the same time creates a greater, uh, a more sustainable future. So I think over the next few weeks, we are just focused on the consultation, mm -hmm. getting started officially today. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as we are done with that, we want to uh, start work on the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, the orders can be placed, people can be mobilized, you can start seeing activity. Mm -hmm so that we move forward, yeah. you know, and the sooner we move forward, the more confidence people will have that, yes, this is for sure. The investment, the questions, then the doubts people have, are you really going to build it? Mm. Is it going to happen? I think uh, the best way to demonstrate it is to show it on the ground. Yeah. So I hope uh, in the next few months, we're able to have more cranes here and start some construction. Yeah, super. Listen, I'm going to call it a day because uh, I've taken quite enough of your time. I'm so grateful for you making so much time for us today. It's been an absolute privilege to talk to you. And, uh, you know, maybe as things progress, we will have the opportunity to sit down with you again and see how things are going, see how the consultation has gone, uh, see about the new capital programme and when it's starting and how it's progressing. Because whilst it is an extremely difficult period for so many people in the industry and around it, suppliers and customers alike, the flip side of that coin is it's also a few, hugely exciting period in the industry in terms of looking at the future and the scale of the investment and the scale of technological change and uh, I think it's a story that is worth telling and we certainly will do our best to tell it uh, as best we can but your role in that will be fundamental and uh, I'd love to have you back on a podcast sure. another time. Thanks Jim and I'm happy to be here as often as required. I do believe that I need to be closer to where the challenges are, where the uh, uh, action is and uh, particularly when it comes to people issues, there is no better way to deal with it than engage with the people and communicate with them. So I'm happy to do anything which helps. Thank yeah. you very much indeed. Yeah. So there you have it. You've heard it from the man at the top. You know, 27, 28 episodes into the Steelcast, we've got to the place where the company's made an announcement. It's made a decision on where it wants to take the technology. Some hugely difficult times and very complex issues to overcome in terms of uh, supplying our customers, getting the scrap supply chain sorted out, getting the substrate sorted out, supporting downstream businesses and supporting our people and communities through such a seismic change in our industry. It'd be great to have uh, Mr Narendra back again in the future and in the meantime we'll catch up with some other people who hopefully can expand on some of those issues we talked about today to help bring some clarity to all of those people who are interested in the sustainability of the UK steel industry. For now, thanks for joining Steelcast, thanks for listening today. If you haven't already, please subscribe through all the usual channels, whether that's Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, you name it, we're there. Look after Steelcast and maybe look back at some of the previous episodes we've recorded and, uh, and hear that all of the experts talked about a very, very complex subject, but one's fascinating for the future of the UK economy. <laughs> <laughs>